Okay, but let's continue with Bartlemey Banasak, who is the Deputy Director of the Department of Science in the Ministry of Science and Higher Education in Poland. And the topic is the same, uh, but the uh, perspective is different. And more importantly, uh, um, Bartlemey uh, was part of the uh, group which drafted this new law, uh, uh, the law 2.0. Uh, he also uh, holds different positions in European um, higher education uh, work groups in the uh, hung uh, European higher education area and also used to serve in the student parliament as other student uh, unions, I guess when you were in the university. Uh, so you got this kind of uh, approach as well. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's indeed my great pleasure to present you the key aspects of the, the reform of higher education and science in Poland, which truly revamps the system and many aspects of the system uh, of uh, science and higher education. And uh, actually the reform has come into force uh, on the 1st of October. And uh, now we are in the process of a uh, very intensive process of implementation, very, very intensive for all sites both ministries, co academic communities, the, the, the leaders of the system, etc. And um, maybe I will start, so start from, the, from the basics, actually. Of course, it's of co obvious that uh, the reform has its rationale. And uh, except from the things uh, which uh, Dominic uh, really pointed out regarding the governance, there, were, there are many other systemic challenges regarding, for instance, the unsatisfactory visibility of outcomes of research. There are issues connected to, the, for instance, the efficiency of doctoral training, the effectiveness of the doctoral training, according to the data we have, is the, the lowest uh, in the OECD countries, for instance. Uh, also, um, the issue of the need of better alignment of the structure of higher education system as a whole with current socio-economic situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, except of the basic data, I think it's very important uh, that we talk also about the trends which we have. And there are, there's one striking graph which concerns Poland, and I think also some other countries in this, uh, in this uh, region. After 1990, we had sharp increase in the uh, number of students and uh, number of higher education institutions. In both cases, it was five-fold increase. Uh, five-fold increase of the student numbers. We also have the, the phenomenon of the dozens of the private education institutions which simply mushroomed across the whole country. Um, but after uh, the mid last decade, previous decade, we started to face uh, the opposite process. Actually, the Professor Kwiek uh, ca called it the deprivatization, actually. And there are many aspects of this, except from the basic thing, which is simply the, the sharp downfall of the student number, like by one third already. It is also uh, especially striking that this is uh, the sharp in decrease of the numbers of the students who pay for this, their studies. And uh, the downfall there is much bigger than the uh, students in the public higher education institutions, uh, the full-time actually students in the public higher education institutions who, who have their studies covered by the, by the government, and also sharp decrease in the number of uh, higher education institutions, private higher education institutions. Um, it's true that uh, the external world, actually, external towards the academic community, was the source of the reliable critical reflection. It was uh, indeed very difficult to have such a reliable critical reflection within the academic community. And uh, it's true that uh, uh, these ideas coming from the outside somehow injected uh, the, the debate, public debate on higher education. Uh, about higher education and science in Poland. But uh, having uh, the reform in mind, we also had to face uh, the challenge that we had to, to make the academic community uh, implement this reform with us. It means that we have to 
create, at least among the leaders of the community, a kind of the feeling of ownership. This is especially important in this community, in, in this actually, in this sector. Uh, I think it is even scientifically uh, proved that it is very especially important in the higher education system. That's why we uh, decided uh, to pursue a kind of the participatory model of policy development. And before uh, we presented uh, the draft, the first draft of the reform, we carried out a kind of the pre-consultation process, which uh, uh, took uh, one year and a half. It started from the uh, competition uh, for the draft guidelines of the new law, and there were three experts team which uh, were coming from the academic community, and actually they prepared us a kind of the variants of the reform, three variants of the reform, which afterwards served as the basis for the further discussion. Of course, uh, we also had uh, intensive pre-consultations with the stakeholders, organization which is actually quite uh, quite common in many countries. We also had international inspirations, uh, regardless uh, of what is uh, said about the relations between Poland and the uh, European Commission. We commissioned actually uh, the peer review report which was pre prepared by the European Commission. And it was quite uh, uh, telling that uh, uh, the, the conclusions from the report were to vast extent in line which, with conclusions of the, this pre-consultation process. We also had these uh, policy borrowings. Uh, I think you, you will see on the next slides uh, some inspirations from the Nordic models, from, uh, from German models, from the French models, also from, from the UK. I will also uh, uh, tell you where, where, when we had this inspiration. But the, the process, uh, the, the part of the process which we boast the most is the National Congress of Science. Uh, the, the main aim of the National Congress of Science was not just to give the, the floor to the leaders of the community, which is very easy, that you invite uh, the presidents, uh, the leaders of the different stakeholder organizations. No, we wanted to give the floor to the individual, individual researchers, individual members of the academic community. Therefore, we organized uh, a cycle of the very big events. Uh, each event uh, was attended by around 500 participants. Each event was dedicated to the uh, different aspect of the reform, and each event was actually took place in the different academic uh, center in different city. Um, and uh, what what happened actually is that uh, the not only the academic community, but in the end also the public opinion started to be interested in the reform. In the end, at the National Congress of Science, which was actually the final event of this process, uh, we we managed to attract uh, 3,000 people who attended uh, this event. Uh, of course, the space was still not enough, but actually it showed uh, not only the, our capacity of actually packing the, the, such a big number of people in one room, it rather showed, uh, first of all, how the interest in the reform actually uh, appeared in the, in the academic community and how the academic community was interested in the, in the, in the changes. And um, the first draft of the new law was then, in, then announced and only afterwards the official legislative process uh, has started. Um, we carried out the fourth month of public consultation after the Congress. And the, the, the draft law was, um, was made actually, maybe I would say better. Um, and then uh, in March it was endorsed by the government. And afterwards it went to the parliament it's true what uh, Dominic said that it, uh, it's some aspects it was, a, it was a bit watered down, for instance, in as regards the the status of the of the board in the, within the university governance system, um, and uh, the, the 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 law itself passed uh, in July and it has come into force on first of October. Uh, what are the main areas of the reform? Actually, as, as you can see on the slides, these are almost all main areas we can imagine when we talk about the spectrum of the higher education system and the, and the science system. 
It is, of course, the autonomy and internal structure of higher education, the system of higher education as a whole, its funding, its doctoral training, academic careers, research evaluation, etc. And uh, I will now show you um, some key aspects of the of the reform. I will start uh, from the from the topic which uh, was already tackled by the Dominic. So I will not focus very much on this. I will just uh, maybe repeat that uh, indeed uh, we we have this problem and we still have because we are now in the process in the, in, of the implementation that the higher education institutions act as the federation of loosely connected units. And uh, except from the empowering the organs at the university level, we also moved all the powers, all the authorizations from the level of the faculty to the level of the, of the university. Because indeed, uh, so far the, the faculty, uh, the university unions were the subject of the system, were the real subject of the system. They had the authorizations to uh, run the study program, they were conferring degrees, it very often happened that actually there were several faculties which were offering the same degrees and uh, they were competing between each other. I mean, it, is, uh, it, is, it was a bit pathological situation, I have to admit. And uh, also the, the faculties were the subject of the research evaluation. Uh, the, the faculties, uh, as Dominic also said, uh, uh, in, they were given directly uh, some uh, streams of the of the funding, um, but uh, except of actually of revamping the organizational structure, we also gave the uh, we increased the autonomy, organizational autonomy of the higher education institutions. As it was said uh, at the beginning of this session, Polish higher education system uh, suffers from the overregulation. And overregulation means uh, prescriptive uh, uh, regulations concerning organizational structure of the institutions. And now we are giving more power, more freedom to the, to the academic community to actually design this structure themselves. It uh, sounds as the obvious thing, but it was not obvious when we were discussing this aspect in, the, in, the, in, the, in our debate on the reform. Sometimes it was even uh, set as the uh, coup against the, the academic freedom, against the autonomy that we actually uh, derive uh, the powers from the from the faculties to the university level. Uh, some some something completely opposite to the uh, to the understanding of the autonomy actually the European Commission, for instance, pr proposed. Um, but except from the organizational autonomy, we also increase the financial autonomy of the higher education of the higher education institutions. So far, uh, the money which were given by the, by the state we were actually, I would say, marked somehow. Actually, the university uh, had to cope with the very prescriptive rules what to do with the money. And uh, according to the new system, uh, the university will be given the block subsidy for the, for the teaching, for the research, and they will have almost full autonomy in, when it comes to the decision what to do with the money. The next aspect of the reform, uh, it is actually diversification of the higher education system. Uh, we actually maintain the basic rule, which is that we have actually two type, in general we have two type of the higher education institutions. There are universities and there are non-universities type professional institution. We call them professional higher education institutions. And uh, so far, there was no really big differentiation within the mission of the academic universities. Uh, at the same time, professional institutions were suffering from the academic drift. So uh, through the uh, changes in the, in the law, we wanted to make the system more, more diverse, diversified. Uh, Firstly, among the group of the academic universities, academic institutions, um, I think that uh, missions will be gradually differentiated thanks to the new funding stream. New funding streams which are based on the performance agreement and there are two streams which are dedicated to two types of the academic uh, 
uh, institutions. Uh, first one, which is the Excellence Initiative for the Research Intensive Universities. I will tell you more about this uh, certain aspect uh, in a few minutes. Um, and the second uh, is the Regional Excellence Initiative. It is dedicated to the academic institutions which are uh, important from the regional point of view. They are important for the development of certain regions. And in this, uh, uh, um, within this, this stream, we are rather supporting uh, the certain disciplines which are excellent on the particular universities. We also want uh, uh, the role of the professional higher education institutions uh, to be more significant and uh, I would say more different from the academic universities. For instance, the only professional higher education institutions will be entitled to offer the short cycle higher education programs. They are not, uh, the short cycle higher education system, they are not yet in the system, but we actually just opened such a possibility and this, o this possibility will be only possible when it comes to the professional higher education institutions. And the last uh, changes when it comes to the structure of the higher education sy system, it is somehow inspired by the Comue model in France. It is the possibility to um, organize the federations of higher education institutions, and also federations of higher education institutions, and for instance, research institutes. Um, I think uh, some of you know how the Comue model uh, works, but uh, the the principle of this model is that uh, uh, despite the fact uh, that each member of the federation actually maintained the identity, they maintained the, the actual status as the separate entity, uh, they also create the, uh, the structure which actually works independently. It can also act in the international community as the one actor. It is what is done, for instance, by France. Uh, you can, I think you will shortly notice some commune, which uh, like the Paris Saclay or the New Sorbonne, which will appear shortly in the rankings, which are simply the, which are s were simply constructed out of the uh, several universities. And uh, the next changes, uh, the next change uh, already mentioned concerned the Excellence Initiative for the Research Intensive University. It is uh, also inspired by the, it is also a kind of the policy borrowing. Uh, you can, I uh, think even the, the name of, the, of this funding stream is quite similar to the, to the arrangements uh, which, are, which are working now in, in Germany. Um, and the um, Excellence Initiative uh, for the Research Intensive Universities is dedicated to the leading higher education institutions in Poland, which have the ambition to become the research intensive universities. And um, the universities, uh, which will fulfill certain conditions, they are mainly connected to the outcomes of the research evaluation, uh, will, be, uh, will have possibility to apply in this uh, competition. Uh, they, will, they will have to uh, prepare a kind of the development strategy or development plan with the goals, preferably measurable, which should relate to quality of research as well as the teaching and learning. This should uh, also propose the pathway to, to achieve these goals. And this uh, development strategy would be actually the basis for the agreement between the ministry and particular institutions. And also this agreement will be basis for the further evaluation, also the midterm and also the, the final evaluations. The, um, in this stream, the international uh, team, uh, the international review team will be involved. And uh, um, in the end, uh, out of 20, because currently we know that uh, when it comes to the first round, it's going to be announced uh, in April, uh, the latest uh, around 20 universities are entitled to, to run in, the, in this contest. In this contest. Uh, 10 universities will be selected, maximum. 10 universities will be selected. And they will be entitled to the additional funding. At, in this additional funding, this uh, additional cap, which account for 10% of the basic funding per year, at least 10% of the basic fund, funding periods. It means a lot 
for the for the institutions, especially if we talk about the big institutions, because usually the universities which we think about are actually very uh, big institutions, and they will be granted such a such additional funding for six years or seven years when it comes to the first first round. Um, after seven years, uh, um, or after or another way. In the, in the last year, they will be evaluated. And um, depending on the results of the evaluation, they will be, the funding will be prolonged or not. But the principle is that, that uh, at least new higher education, uh, at, least new, at least two new higher education institutions should replace uh, some of the institutions which were actually selected in the, uh, in the first round. So it will be, Always like that. That actually there were some institutions will be will be actually removed from the from the from the framework, and they will be replaced by the uh, by the new institutions, which will be fulfilling the certain conditions. Another big change is actually the research evaluation system, and uh, it is actually a big change because so we give a very significant role to the research evaluation out outcomes. They will be very important when it comes to the funding. Uh, they will appear in the certain aspects of the formula of the, of the, of the, for the funding. Uh, also, numerous authorizations are, will, be, uh, will depend on the evaluation outcomes. Uh, and they will depend automatically. For instance, the right to, for higher education institution to confer a degree in certain discipline will automatically automatically depend on the outcomes of the, of the research evaluation. Um, we also uh, made a huge change. Uh, I, feel, I think it is at least a huge change from the perspective of the Polish academic community that will be, will be no longer compare the university units between themselves because very often they were simply uncomparable. But we will be compare the activity of the higher education institutions and also research institutions in the frame of the certain discipline, the discipline which is represented by the at least 12 researchers. Um, and also, um, this, res this research evaluation, the changes in the research evaluation, they are connected to the changes in the official classification of the field of science. And uh, I can tell you, this here we had uh, one of the biggest storm in the whole the debate. We had to cope with the narrative like that, that uh, if the, uh, some discipline disappears, it means that the whole, uh, whole aspect of the research actually disappears from, the, from Poland actually. That is actually, it's terminated, it's, it's forbidden. And th this, this actually narrative, you have to cope with that. It was very sound, it uh, appeared in the mainstream media. Um, in some cases, it was very effective because actually, uh, for instance, in case of astronomy, uh, they had really good PR and uh, the, the pressure from the astronomy, which actually convinced many key players in, the, in Poland that actually uh, having no astronomy in the classification means no astronomy. It, uh, in the end, actually, we had to add this under the pressure the astronomy to the list because previously actually in the originally it was just the part of the physics as it is actually the, in the OECD classification which actually served us as the important point of reference for the for building this uh, this classification um, actually we had also very strong rational for actually changes in this classification because we, because we had very uh, we have many uh, very narrow disciplines um, very often they were actually the, the, the borders, the boundaries between disciplines were simply artificial. They were rather uh, created because of the certain interests uh, within the academic community rather than actually uh, merit-based uh, arguments. Um, but also a very important argument for these changes is that, that in the new systems, in the new system it would be very difficult to make uh, the research evaluation within the very narrow discipline. It would be simply not feasible. That, that for, therefore, we had to consolidate uh, the disciplines in the, in the bigger units. Um, and also, uh, when it comes to the criteria 
Uh, here we also had uh, a number of important changes. Changes important, of course, from the perspective of the academic community, but I think there are certain aspects which could be also interesting for you. For instance, um, in the context uh, of the discussion which we had uh, in the early afternoon, we talked about how the actually um, the, 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 the actually the academic community can be rewarded for actually communicating their research effectively to the to the outside outside world. Actually, in our new system, it will be rewarded because it is actually tackled in the third criteria, which is somehow also inspired by the research evaluation framework uh, carried out in the uh, UK. It is uh, one of the three main criteria. It will be based on the peer review, and then in this um, in the framework of this criteria, uh, the, actually the the impact of the research carried out in the particular institutions for the outside world, for the society, for the economy will be evaluated, and if it's good, it will be also rewarded. When it comes to the other criteria, we have the quality of research output, mainly publications and patents, also financial outcomes, uh, mainly the, 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 the grants, scientific grants. But uh, what we did, uh, uh, what is very important, uh, is that actually we limited number of metrics. It was actually, the, we had very strong evidence that uh, too many metrics uh, actually jeopardize the whole system. Because uh, firstly, we have many metrics which uh, doesn't change anything in the final results. And secondly, it means that these uh, uh, metrics which are not important uh, make, uh, makes, uh, uh, limited, limits the impact of the actually metrics which are really important. So uh, that's why we uh, decided to limit the number of metrics. And also, in order to pursue this, uh, the new system of the, of the research evaluation, we are establishing, now we are now in the process of establishing the new uh, registers, which will support the whole system. One register uh, is quite common in many evaluation systems, is the register of scientific journals. We'll uh, base it uh, mainly on the international databases, uh, not one, but the, the two key players, which is Scopus Web, Web of Science. But also, we'll include the, the leading uh, journals, some, uh, some journals from, the, from Pol Polish uh, universities, or actually simply Polish journals, which uh, are on the level which, which we can say they aspire to be, to be in this uh, international databases. But also, we, um, um, we have to admit that in certain disciplines, in certain uh, areas of research, the databases and the indicators which are calculated there are not always reliable. Therefore, we are of course also we also invited the peer ex the the expert to sometimes to change some uh, some results, which could be derived directly from the from the indicators. And then we have the academic degrees. Uh, just uh, one thing uh, which I I think I have to tell tell you. This is about the Dr. Habitovane degree. I think in many countries in, the, in this area we have uh, another degree which is higher than the doctor. In Poland, uh, the Dr. Habitovane, is, Dr. Habitovane is a kind of uh, the recognition of the researcher that he is actually, or he or she is actually independent researcher. Um, and actually we keep this understanding uh, maybe not, not entirely, but to some extent we keep this understanding in the meaning that uh, the doctor habilitovane means authorization to supervise the doctoral thesis, for instance, or actually review the doctoral thesis, but that's all. So far, actually, uh, having the doctoral habilitovane degree meant actually having the certain privileges. Privileges like, for instance, being calculated within the uh, minimum number of staff which is needed for the for the offering the study program. Uh, in effect, in the situation that actually it was more important to have the degree of the Dr. Habilitovane than actually to have the real research outcomes. If you have Dr. Habilitovane, you are in the minimum, which is important for actually to offer the, the study programs. It is for you enough 
to be important and needed in the system. And now um, we change this and uh, we feel uh, uh, after the, the question, many questions, the, the thousands of questions, which we are now now go, get, we, are, we are actually getting, uh, that it is actually not perceived by many people as the good thing. But I think are the but the people, the members of the academic community, which actually are interested in the uh, good changes, actually it is uh, it is one of the most important change. And um, another. Uh, new change, important change, is actually concerned the doctoral training. And uh, I have to admit that this is the most costly part of the reform. The new uh, uh, model of the doctoral training will be based on the doctoral schools, in many countries called the graduate schools. To, to this, uh, mm, when we talk just about the graduate school, school it is not shocking information because graduate school or doctoral schools are actually f are functioning in most of the higher education systems in the European higher education area or, or at least the European Union. Um, but uh, what is uh, the, the indeed the, 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 the big change in our system that each, in principle, each PhD candidate will get the scholarship. And uh, at least for the Polish standards, it will be very high uh, scholarship. It is comparable to the salary of the, of the researcher, of the early stage researcher. Um, we um, uh, regulated the one important uh, point in the, in, the, in the monitoring process, the process of the monitoring of the development of the, of the thesis, which, which is the midterm evaluation. This kind of the new milestone in the doctoral training, and actually everything depends on, on it when we talk about the career of the, of the PhD candidate, because if, it, if he or she fails, he, has, has not, he cannot continue. If he actually passes, then actually he, is, he or she is granted the higher amount of the salary or, or, the, or the scholarship. We are also implementing the trans full transparency of the doctoral thesis, it, which has not been the case in Poland. We, we just had the reviews transparent, not the uh, thesis as the whole. And also, uh, at the end, uh, uh, I will just draw your attention to some, some changes related to the, to the teaching, to the study programs. Uh, I already mentioned about uh, lifting the minimum number of staff, which is needed to the scientific, uh, to the, to actually to, to run the study programs. Um, we also lifting many obstacles concerning delivery of the international joint programs. We simply want to uh, give a possibility, possibility to implement the European approach for criteria assurance of joint programs and simply dem limit the situation and obstacles which come from the fact that uh, provisions in certain countries are simply contradictory. And we want to, uh, our system to be more flexible when it comes to actually provision of the of the joint programs so actually the the much less contradictory rules and also uh, in two years from now we are going to implement the new type of the quality assurance model except from the program accreditation which will stay as the basic ones and it, ha it has to stay as the basic ones taking into account that we still have the 400 high education institutions of the quite diversified quality. Uh, we will try to implement the institutional evaluation. And uh, having the positive outcome of the institutional evaluation will meet, in the end, uh, uh, no program accreditation. And it, mean also, it will mean also the full program autonomy for the such higher education institutions which will have the positive outcome. And uh, last not, but not least, uh, um, all reforms need money. I already told you about uh, some financial, ch some changes con concerning the fun funding model. But I also uh, wanted to s tell you that uh, um, we expect in a uh, few years, uh, the next few years, uh, quite big uh, increase of the funding for higher education. We managed to convince our finance minister to. Uh, uh, put a regulation in the law 
which guarantees gra mm -hmm. gradual increase of funding for the research. And it's actually depend on the uh, GDP growth. And each year, uh, uh, the higher education, uh, higher education system or research actually will be given the bigger and bigger chunk of the growth of the GDP. This is the, the logic how, uh, of, the, of the increase of the funding for the higher education and research. So this is all from, from me and I think I will get some questions also. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, thank you, Bartome. And uh, I think we have learned from your lecture that it's a wide-ranging and vision-led uh, reform, and not only controlling, but also a lot, a lot of teaser for the academic institutions and opportunities. Uh, we are out of time, in fact, um, okay. and we got a social program as well. I am uh, looking for Gergely. Probably be, you will comment, but probably one or two questions can okay. be made. Yes, first, Professor Van Ziel. Yeah, I think it's very. Okay, uh, it is here. I think I've, I think it's very it's very typical of what we experience in academia, and it was a really nice program because we had tension between the university position and the ministry position. The ministry wanting to control and to measure, and the university just wanting to be autonomous. My experience of university governance is is very simple. Um, a university is defined by the people that are there. And um, they have a faculty loyalty and not an institutional loyalty, as you mentioned. And therefore, the role of the rector and the role of the, 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 uh, the management of the university is, first of all, a role of sense-making. They have to recognize the contours of all those people that are there doing things. And then after they've made that sense, they have to start giving sense, supporting, strengthening, strengthening the contours. And any system of, of law and of governance which allows that mm -hmm. will make a university successful. It's easier said than done, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's um, the, the idea that a, that, a, that a university rector can have the same amount of control and power as somebody who runs an industry consortium uh, is um, is is not is not true, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that people in the ministry uh, sometimes. Forget. I think it is not the same level of the control because uh, the the chief of the company is not elected by the by the workers. It is the, the the first 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 uh, important change, uh, and I think that uh, the the level of the. Inter, I would say interference, but I think it's not maybe the, 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 be, the, best, uh, the best word from the outside world uh, in the framework of the new board and also the power of the rectors is still lower than in many systems, like in, even lower in the, in the, than in actually in, the, in many lenders, for instance, system. Mm -hmm. Lower than in, for instance, Denmark. Lower than in actually Finland, etc., in Switzerland. Uh, but still, for us, it's a big change. But uh, I have to also admit that it's extreme challenge for the rectors, which are currently the rectors, which were actually elected in the previous system, and they are um, they are actually responsible for implement the new system, the new statutes. And uh, I've, I've, we've, we expect that this uh, change will happen gradually. It will not. There are, there are very uh, there, there are some universities which are very which have actually the leadership which is very forward looking, and I think they will give uh, they will give this certain pace, but I think it will take a bit time. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Peter Hovat. Would like to make a comment or make a question? It was very impressive your your system of uh, governance. But I have only one very simple question. Is there in your uni universe a room also for uh, private uh, initiated uh, universities and higher education institutions, mm -hmm. uh, founded perhaps by private persons or uh, perhaps some non-government organization, churches, and so on? Mm -hmm. Is there a room for oh, private um, initiatives? There is, and there is, and uh, 
I s maybe I will uh, 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 may I maybe pass the wrong message at the beginning because uh, we don't have only the bad private higher education institutions, which uh, we we have actually currently a few, quite a few number of the uh, non-public higher education institutions which are competitive towards the public higher education institutions, and it is definitely the the room for for them. And uh, they're already beneficiaries of the of the new of the new streams. For instance, um, I told you about the uh, uh, excellence initiative for the research-intensive universities, which are, is going to happen only in April. But when it comes to the regional uh, excellence initiative, it has been already announced, and the results were already already announced. And among the uh, the winners, there are public there are non-public higher education either. So uh, this is just an example because, um, in principle, we do not divide when it comes to the, uh, except from the funding rules, some funding rules, we don't uh, uh, differentiate when it comes to the powers like the academic powers, especially between the private and the, and the public. This we rather differentiate between the good and bad. We try at least. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Uh, as I see, uh, the very last question after that we have to leave. Uh, two short remarks. Uh, so it is very important to experience in your uh, presentation that the reform, uh, so the, the reform uh, lead the university in Poland uh, increasing financial autonomy and the reform not abolish the financial autonomy. It is a very important thing. And the other thing is the fact that the consultancy lasted at four months mm -hmm. and not for days or four hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, because in Hungary, a legislation uh, works with this uh, characteristic with no consultancy. Thank you very much. Okay. Actually, we are quite particular actually in having such a long consultation process. Actually, it, yeah. it was not also the case previously. Actually, but anyway, in the higher education system, the, uh, in comparison to other systems, some, some other aspects of the system in, the, in Poland, actually, um, the, the standards are a bit higher, I have to admit. So um, we rather expect that the other sectors will be copying our uh, our solutions, then the, we are copying the solutions of other. Okay. <laughs> well, it's not copying, benchmarking, you, you know. <laughs> and well, uh, it, uh, it, 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 it was uh, quite uh, good to hear that you have relied on the practice of Germany and, Fra and France and, and also Britain as well with impact assessment and so on. So I think uh, this is quite, quite uh, we, we can benchmark the benchmarking as well. So you have made this a study and also the consultation with the, with the public and with the other stakeholders. So it, I think it's quite a good practice that we can share.